It had been a little over two years since Chancellor Palpatine had announced his sweeping reforms and reshaped the Galactic Republic into the First Galactic Empire. All of that didn't mean much here on the Outer Rim, though. When Owen Lars stared out across his humble moisture farm, the sands of Tatooine looked the same as they always had, and the twin suns rose and set much like they had for generations. As Owen looked at the pair of distant stars descending lower towards the horizon, he was happy to have company. Luke had finally figured out how to walk a few months ago, just in time to offer a hand during the harvest season. During that time, he followed Owen around, clumsily tripping over himself as he figured out the finer art of placing one foot in front of the other. Now, the main harvest was behind them, and while the pair stared at the twin suns, they knew that night was drawing near and they could enjoy some well-earned rest. Vaporator, Owen said to Luke, as he held the two-year-old's hand in his own. Can you say that? Vaporator. Owen might not have been a Jedi or a great starship pilot, but he was an honest man, and he was proud of his honest work. If he had his way, he'd keep Luke on Tatooine forever and teach him to make a living as a local moisture farmer. With the way the Empire was increasing its holdings, there was no point in going off-world and endangering your life by trying to settle elsewhere. It'd be far too easy to run a fool of an Imperial patrol that seemed all too eager to push their weight around the Outer Rim citizens. As Luke struggled to repeat after Owen, the boy's uncle drew him in closer and let him lean into his chest. We have to be quiet so they can rest, Owen said again, pointing to the white and orange stars dipping ever lower in the flats of the flats. They have a big day tomorrow baking the sands. Luke began to rub his eyes and Owen knew it was time to go in. He nuzzled his chin covered in the prickly beginnings of a beard in the boy's blonde hair and smiled. I know someone else who needs some rest, he said, as the toddler slowly started to fall against Owen's chest, signaling that it was time for his uncle to lift him up and carry him to bed. But before the pair could turn in, Owen spotted something, a silhouette on the flats. He could barely make out what the figure was, but the massive dust cloud it was generating, it was moving very fast, nearly as fast as a landspeeder. In these parts south of the Junlun Waste, you wouldn't approach a farmer's territory unannounced, especially not with the darkness of dust on your feet. Owen was worried, and rightfully so. It might have been a raider, one of the Tuscans who descended from the canyons nearby, but they traveled in packs. Owen reached for his electric binoculars and turned the dials to get a closer view. When he placed the lenses against his eyes, the silhouette took on a clearer shape. Although the binoculars transformed light rays into bluish hue, Owen could clearly see a humanoid body with cyborg-enhanced legs sprinting towards his farm. He couldn't quite make out the being's face, as it was hidden beneath a tattered black cloak, similar to the robes his stepbrother had worn the time he had visited Tatooine years ago. In a worried shout, Owen screamed for his wife, Beru. He ordered the young woman who had only recently become Luke's adopted mother to bring his scoped blaster rifle up from the basement of the farm. As she ran over, Owen handed her Luke in exchange for the weapon and braced for the arrival of the being. In only a few seconds, the black-cloaked creature had covered nearly a kilometer and was at Owen's doorstep. There's something I can help you with, friend? Owen asked, in the way a man eager to shoot a trespasser might pretend to offer a question. But the figure didn't respond. It crouched a bit lower on the ground, feeling the heat of the sun still fresh on the sand, preparing to pounce. Owen was nervous. He could clearly see the traveler at this point, and it sure wasn't a Tuscan. And the confirmation only made him more worried. I'm going to have to ask you to stop right there and let me see your hands. As he disabled the safety on the rear of his blaster and placed his index finger against a rough steel trigger, he hadn't used this rifle in years. Even when he had to dispose of womp rats that chewed on the rings of his condensers, Owen preferred traps or lures instead of brutal rifles. But now, desperate to protect his only son, Luke, and his new wife, Beru, Owen was prepared to fire as many blaster rounds as needed. I ain't gonna tell you again. Stop and show me your hands or I'll drop you. Owen shouted again. This time he was dead serious. He shoved the butt of the rifle into his right shoulder, brought the barrel parallel to the ground, and leaned his eyes behind the sights. And when he noticed the black cloaked figure was no closer to slowing down, he fired. But even with his exceptional aim, which had been honed by his father during Owen's childhood, Luke's uncle missed. Somehow, sensing the supersonic projectile was inbound, the black figure's horrifying claw-like limbs leapt into the air, and before it even landed, it reached out with a hand and yanked the weapon out of Owen's hands. 
With another swift gesture, the opponent smashed the handle against Owen's face, sending him to the sand. Baru screamed for her husband, but he was out cold. She was always more perceptive than Owen, and she could tell what the being wanted. As it walked towards her, its cold black eyes, hidden beneath its hood, were staring directly at Luke. So it's true, there is a son, it said, seeming to growl. As the being walked closer and closer, it felt a surge of power somewhere in the desert. Someone else was here, someone strong in the force. The cyborg paused and glanced around the surface of the moisture farm. I know you're here, but only silence answered him. To the side, Owen coughed, unable to rouse from his sleep. Blood seeped out of the corners of his mouth, staining the sand. But the black figure didn't care. The mysterious power he sensed was familiar. It was, in fact, the very thing he had come here to find. I missed you on Camino by two days, the being said. I was a day behind you on Genosis. I came across a corpse on Mustafar. I thought it might have been you. Imagine my relief. He was describing the links he had gone through on this hunt. All the places he had been before arriving on Owen's moisture farm on the fringes of the Dune Sea. An old junk dealer in Mos Espa choked up a name before I separated him from his greed. I knew if I found the boy, you'd come. And when his final threat was done, a voice answered from beyond sight. Does Palpatine know? Calm and cool, whoever spoke couldn't have been more different than the terrible creature that had stalked Owen and Luke. No, there is no Palpatine, no Emperor, no Jedi. There is no light, no dark. Just you and I, here, now. The cloaked figure responded, waiting for his opponent to reveal himself. And then slowly, as if he had been waiting his entire life for the moment, someone appeared. We can do this for old time's sake, but I was a Padawan then. Now, you won't heal clean. And then, in an eruption of sand, Obi-Wan leapt out from beneath the desert, retrieved the hilt of his lightsaber, and boldly stepped towards the figure. And in the same moment, the hunter, who had so cruelly bashed Owen's face with the blaster rifle, shredded his own black cloak and showed his true self. It was Maul, healed and reformed. The horns on his head had grown with age and were now each nearly a foot long. The former Sith had waited years to claim his revenge. His hunt for Kenobi had brought him to more planets than he cared to remember, and after all this time, he finally found the old Jedi Master on a barren world in the middle of the western reaches. In a single gesture, the Dathomirian raised his dual lightsabers above his head, clicked a button, and ignited the familiar crimson blades. He launched himself at Kenobi, hoping to use his speed and cyborg enhancements to defeat the gray-haired Jedi. As Kenobi raised his blue lightsaber to block Maul's attack, the red-skinned opponent leapt into the air and used his claw feet to grab Obi-Wan's neck. It had been years since Kenobi had used his lightsaber, and even more years since he had fought a life-and-death battle, and age, it seemed, had started to catch up. Desperate to break free, Kenobi waved his blade around until he found his leverage and pushed out of Maul's hold. Now on the offensive, the Jedi Master brought his blade into a low guard, hoping to strike Maul's chest. But the former Sith was still quite a formidable duelist. With a deft swing of his blade, the crimson lightsaber blocked Kenobi. But Maul wasn't the only one who had improved his skills. The years of service in the Clone Wars had made Kenobi a far greater swordsman than nearly anyone else in the Order. With a bold strike from his unarmed hand, Kenobi punched through Maul's horn, shattering the two that grew above his forehead. As Maul flinched, Obi-Wan felt the momentum of the battle shift. He swung his lightsaber through the air, confusing Maul with the blue spectacle. And then, in one gesture, Kenobi used the force to leap high above the desert flats. He brought his lightsaber directly down on Maul, cutting through his left arm and destroying the center of his staff. As his red flesh sizzled, sending a trail of smoke in the air, Maul fitfully tried to survive. One more swing of Kenobi's blade and he'd be dead. And although it seemed like the ancient Jedi merely wanted to disarm Maul, the former Sith couldn't take the chance. So he quickly kicked old Ben away into the hood of Owen's landspeeder. The collision would have broken the back of a lesser man, and perhaps it would have even injured any other Jedi in the Order. But today, Kenobi was fighting to fulfill his duty, to protect Luke, as Maul used the force to yank his still-functioning half of his lightsaber into his hand. He turned towards the landspeeder, hoping to see the unconscious body of Obi-Wan. But instead, he saw the open end of Kenobi's lightsaber. The Jedi Master had somehow survived the collision with the landspeeder uninjured, and now had Maul's head against the tip of his blade and nowhere to run. Obi-Wan wanted to finish the fight right then and there. If he could kill Maul, he could get his revenge for his own master's death all those years ago. And perhaps he could get revenge for all the horrible things that Maul's former Sith Lord Darth Sidious has brought into existence.
But this wasn't the Jedi way. So Kenobi allowed the emotions into his mind and then wisely allowed them to leave, like a wave going back to sea. But before Obi-Wan could prove to himself that he was greater than his own rage, a massive orange bolt of blaster fire punched through Maul's head, leaving a golf ball-sized crater in his skull. The former Sith died before his body hit the floor. A few meters away, Uncle Owen, still wounded from Maul's brutal attack, held the barrel of his blaster rifle. He had fired the killing shot. I'll take him out to the Dune Sea and burn the body there, Kenobi quietly told Luke's adoptive father. But when Kenobi inquired whether or not young Luke was safe, he received an answer that he didn't expect. I told you I'd keep him safe, and I will, even if that means from you, Owen told the Jedi Master, and then offered a final warning. You don't come back here, understand? Even though Kenobi had just saved the life of Owen and everyone else on the farm, the old farmer didn't trust him. After all, it was Kenobi's old enemy that was the cause of this turmoil, and it appeared, at least to Owen, that everyone would be a lot safer if Obi-Wan just left and allowed Luke to forget who his father was.